Welcome back to our study of Christian beliefs. Now, in chapter 12, we're going to look at the question, what is election? It's very important that you, as a Christian, understand biblical election. Now, let me just say, this is a rather deep subject. It'll be a deep chapter. And at the same time, it's very important because there's a tremendous amount of controversy surrounding this biblical truth. And let me just say from the very beginning, there ought not be any controversy. And in my opinion, the controversy does not settle around uh, deep theological divides. I think it settles around pride. For you see, the doctrine of election, as we will see, really exemplifies an understanding of God's grace, God's goodness, and it points to God's glory. And in my opinion, the only reason why that is challenged is because of human pride and sinfulness. But let's go now to Wayne Grudem and let's have his input and share his insights. Grudem says to us, there has been much controversy regarding the doctrine of election. It's also known as predestination. Election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved only because of his sovereign good pleasure. It's important to see where this definition and therefore this doctrine comes from. You see, in the New Testament, there are many teachings on election. Several passages in the New Testament affirm quite clearly that God ordained beforehand those who would be saved. Read Acts 13, 48. See Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Revelation 17, 8, 2 Timothy 1, 9. You see, God saved us and called us to himself because of his own purpose and his unmerited grace in eternity past. Those who will be saved will be saved because God in his grace chose to act upon and draw unto himself some, some. What does this mean? Well, these New Testament authors throughout the scriptures present the doctrine of election as a comfort to all who believe. This is not heavy. This is comforting. Romans 8, 28, for God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. In the next verse, verse 29, he's conforming some into a greater Christ likeness. This is what he foreknew. We're told God foreknew and predestined his people to be conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8, 29. Those whom God predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. That's Romans 8, 30. Those whom he justified, he will also glorify. Again, Romans 8, 30. From eternity to eternity, God has acted and will act with the good of his people in mind. 2 Timothy 1.9. The place where pride creeps in is everybody thinks that, well, they should be God's people. And if somehow they're not included, or somebody that they think should be included in the elect, then somehow that must in, infringe upon the goodness of God. May it never be. That is blasphemous. So again, if the pride of man could be laid down and simply accept the goodness and the glory and the grace of God as he deems to share it, there would be no confusion. There would be no controversy. You see, a natural response to God's work on our behalf is that we would live in the praise of his glory. If we understood this, we wouldn't just be comforted. We'd be praising God. See Ephesians 1, 12 and 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 4. See, God is the one who is ultimately responsible for salvation and all the good things that accompany, accompany it. It's God and his grace and his goodness that's on display in this doctrine of election. We are obligated to give thanks to God for such a great salvation, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. And our salvation, we need to understand that it's not of our own work, but instead it's a gift of God. How could we take pride in a gift that was given? See Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. This truth should not lead us to think that evangelicals are somehow uh, not in need of sharing the gospel. Evangelism is desperately needed because God chooses to save many through the works and helps of other humans. 
2 Timothy 2.10, we see this with Paul telling Timothy, quote, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You see again the tension of sovereign grace. God is doing this. It's all of grace and human responsibility. Paul is working feverishly for the elect. Somebody might say, well, why? If they're elect, why does he have to work that way? Because he loves God and in his love he obeys God and he has come to see that God does most of his work in a human context through other humans. You see, election was Paul's guarantee that there would be some success in his evangelism. He knew that God had yet unadopted children. That's why we talk about seeking out the lost. We find the lost and then we grow the found. We're joining God at work in what only he can do. It is as if someone invited Paul to go fishing and said to him, Hey, Paul, I guarantee that you'll catch some fish. If you'll fish long enough, you'll catch fish because God has stocked the pond with his fish. Amen. It is as if someone invited Paul. Think about that. It's as though God himself invited you and me to go fishing for men in a world where he promised, Oh, there's not going to be a ton of fish. And most of the time, what you'll find is that there's not a desire for me. But, but if you'll go fishing for men and stay consistent, I promise you I will fill the net with my fish. Amen. So what doesn't this mean? If that's what it means, what doesn't it mean? Grudem says that affirming the doctrine of election does not mean that our choices don't matter and our actions don't have any consequences. No, not at all. You see, Scripture continually views us as personal creatures who make willing choices to accept or reject the gospel. See Revelation 22:17 and Matthew 11:28. You see, real decisions have eternal consequences, as we see in John 3:18. And while a proper understanding of election does give real value to our decisions and choices, it does not mean that God's decision was based upon our choices. That might be one of the most important things you'll hear. Do not understand this to mean that God changes or responds to our changes or our responses. No, it does not mean that God's decision was based upon our choices. See Ephesians 1.4 and Romans 8.29. Now, that might lead somebody to say, well, then are we truly free? Are we able to be held responsible for our decisions? Let's take a look at what Mr. Grudem says. Many believe that if the doctrine of election is true, then we aren't really free. Definitions and assumptions lead to misunderstanding. Use a term other than free so as to communicate more carefully. Let's not talk about an absolute freedom but let's talk about the kind of freedom that has privilege and responsibility. For example, the Bible appeals to our ability to make voluntary choices or willing choices hundreds of times. We aren't forced to make choices contrary to our own will. We ultimately do what we desire to do. We, init we imitate God's own activity of deciding to do things that are consistent with his character. That's the healthy Christian walk. Therefore, if we respond to Christ's invitation in a positive way, we can honestly say that we chose to respond to Christ while also saying that it was in ways we cannot fully understand ordained by God. God also created us so that our choices would be real choices. Our choices do not need to be absolutely free of any involvement by God in order to be real voluntary, willing choices. No, the Bible never puts any blame on God for anyone else's rejection of Christ's claims. See John 8, 43 and 44, Romans 1, 20. So this is one of those places where the tension is real. You've got to understand you've got enough freedom. You have the ability to choose that which you want. And when you choose God, it's giving him the glory and acknowledging that you would never do that on your own. It was his grace that seeded in you the desire, the want to, to be drawn to him. This gives God the glory for all that is good. 
and it holds man accountable for all of their decisions, our decisions, to go against God. Again, this is where the pride of man tends to rise up. They don't like that. Well, the word of God says this is the way that it is, and therefore God's word says it, that settles it. Pride or no pride, that's the truth and love. So the consistent pattern in scripture, says Grudem, is that people who remain in unbelief do so because they are unwilling to come to God, and the blame for such unbelief always lies with the unbeliever, never with God. So does this mean that God is not fair? Well, some people object that the doctrine of election isn't really, quote, fair. It's important to understand that fair really is with respect to salvation. You, you and I don't want fair. If we had fair, we'd be damned. Fair would say always justice, no grace. If you give some justice, you must give all justice if what you want is fair. What we have is so much better than fair. We have grace, we have mercy, we have love. And the fact that God doesn't choose to rescue everyone from their sin does not impugn in any way the beauty of his grace, his mercy, and his love. It would be perfectly fair for God to save, to not save any human beings who sinned and rebelled against him, just as he did with the angels. He didn't save any angels. If they sinned, they were cast out. I pray that our responses to these words, these truths, will reveal a lot about our heart and our willingness to submit to our sovereign creator. Ask yourself, does this doctrine make you rise up with bitterness and frustration? Or do you see the amazing grace of almighty God? How you respond to this doctrine will tell you an awful lot about what's going on deep in the chambers of your heart. Does God want everyone to be saved? Yes, he does. God has great sorrow when he thinks about those who will not be saved. Read, please, Ezekiel 33, 11, Luke 19, 41, Matthew 23, 37, and Romans 9, 2. You see, the love that God gives us for our fellow human beings and the love that he commands us to have for our neighbor cause us great sorrow when we realize that not everyone will be saved. Again, we begin to have the heart of God when we have a heart for those who are pushing away Almighty God. And yet, the punishment of sinners is a righteous outworking of God. It's his justice, and we should not think that it's wrong that sinners who reject God will end up in eternal damnation. Again, this is where your heart is going to be tested. This is where the question of pride or purity is going to be evaluated and revealed. You see, God gives common grace to all of us. Every human being has different degrees of common grace. We are able to see a sunrise. We're given breath. We have a day of opportunity to surrender to victory in Jesus the Christ. There is a common grace that the Lord shares with all. His continual pouring out of blessings on all people will show him as just on the day of judgment when he finally punishes those who rejected him. It's all of grace, all of grace. Those who are saved know it supremely. Those who reject him reject his amazing grace. I pray as Grudem puts an end to this chapter, that you'll embrace this. Our appropriate response, our appropriate response to others is humility, since individually we have no claim on any portion of God's grace. It's all a gift from him. May we, the Christian community, be empathetic with those who push away and reject this truth and love, remembering that if it were not for the grace of God, we'd be in the exact same place. So let us champion all of God's truth and love, these doctrines as well, and let us do it with an empathy and an unwavering, unwavering commitment to the truth with an ever-present empathy for those who don't accept it. Amen and amen.